Hello and welcome to the Mothership. I am, of course, the Commander-in-Chief, Lax Ivrak. Good to see everybody. Today's episode is brought to you, as always, Black Coffee and Copenhagen Snuff. Right arm, brother. Everyone, uh, you know, I feel that our community is a collecting community. And uh, I wanted to share with everyone today my... Um, my sword and knife collection. Now, this is not every knife that I own. These are the uh, ones that uh, hold special value, whether sen mostly sentimental, actually. Uh, but this will be a showing of all of my swords. Unsheath thy sword. Anyway, let's get right into it. Uh, we're going to probably... Let's start with these two knives real quick. These were gifts from a beautiful friend of the channel, Dylan V, the professor of badass. Uh, right in the middle of my ship, how about that? These are made by, y'all go find Dylan on Instagram. Uh, these are made by a friend of his, Fadus Blades. If y'all were following my old Instagram that got shit canned, 10.K followers down the drain, but I like, don't give a fuck. You might have seen me cut a bottle with this bad boy. Uh, these are not old in any way. These are made by a craftsman. You can find them Fadis Blades, I believe is how you say it. And if y'all, uh, you go to my new Instagram, go to my friends and followers, you'll find Dylan and then I'm sure through them you can find these. So, very nice, very nice. Uh, here is a another knife. My grandfather brought this back from some trip to Africa. I'm sure it's just a tourist. Uh, you know, this blade definitely looks like it was hammered out of a 55 gallon drum, which is probably extremely traditional uh, but we have a hand-carved handle. Not sure what kind of wood that is. It is fairly light-colored. So, I, you know, um, who knows what it is, but it's very, very nice. And we have the same kind of wood carved into this face. And these shells. Very lovely rope stitching. Very nice, very nice, yes. And now I want to show you these two blades. Now these, these come from Saudi Arabia. They're definitely, shout out to uh, Matt Easton, as I'm sure he would recognize it. These are definitely more of the tourist style blades. Um, but quite the, let me see if I can't focus here, quite the lovely patterns. Uh, this wire edge appears to be uh, silver soldered into place. These, these little balls on each end here, these are hollow. You can see right here, these are hollow and they're soldered together. So quite the amount of work did go into this okay and this is its companion it lost the red bead many years ago more of like a letter opener i guess but um lovely work lovely work all i'm all hand done obviously and you can see where it's soldered together these, these, um, and I don't mind telling anybody, it might get me on some sort of list, but <clears throat> these two knives were given to me personally as a Christmas present from one Mr. Adel Archibir of Saudi Arabia. And if y'all look up Adel Archibir, he is the, he is the, I believe he is the ambassador to the United States from Saudi Arabia currently. When I knew him years ago, he was the foreign affairs advisor to the crown prince. But this is a Christmas present 
delivered. Oh my God! Fucking shell shock. The mothership's parked under an acorn tree, so that fucking got me, didn't it? Ah! Uh, jumpy lack? Well, since 1989. Uh, but anyway, so this is a very unique and special item, uh, as it was given to me by a friend who I haven't seen or spoke to in, gosh, almost two decades now, I don't know. But yeah, Mr. Adel Archabir of Saudi Arabia hand-delivered me these as a Christmas present from his Learjet. Isn't that fucking cool? So... That probably freaks y'all out a little bit more about whack, don't it? Those are very special gifts, very special gifts. I have two more knives, but I'm going to save those for the last two as they are the piece de resistance. And uh, I think anybody who is a collector, Samurai Bird, uh, Matt East and Shad, um, fucking Mr. Rizzo, Matt Jensen, all you guys, I think you'll appreciate these last two knives but let's get into the small sword collection i have not small sword collection but not a lot of members collection what i don't know anyway let's start with we'll start with this now this i'm 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 working on this the only thing original to what i bought here is this blade i bought this when i was in thailand Gosh, I don't know how many years ago that was. And it was like, you know, 4,000 baht, which is like 20 bucks or some shit. But it's, uh, it's a fairly nice blade. Uh, the, the, the fullers do terminate in the same area. They look like they were ground in by hand. Very nice. The handle, the original handle split a long time ago. I am shaping this one. I'm putting a palm swell on it. And I am going to mount this basket from a cold steel, uh, what is that called? The English back sword. But I will be mounting this on there. So, pretty cool blade, uh, very fun to swing. These uh, Chinese Dao styles, very, very fun to swing. Uh, so, but we'll show you, we're gonna do a wrap and everything and we'll show you this when it's completed. My personal favorite sword that I own, which is out of commission at the moment, is this cold steel English back sword. The basket you just saw on that last sword came from this. I do not like the basket on here. Uh, I will be do making a custom uh, medieval style cross guard. Um, and probably, I don't know, I might tr keep this as it is a nice handle. Um, this is definitely my favorite sword. It is single-edged, as is it a back, as it is a back sword. I have sharpened the false edge, um, but this is a hell of a cutter. Um, <clears throat> the blade profile. This is my favorite fucking cold steel sword. Lynn Thompson. This was a fucking winner, man. And uh, I hope to even purchase a few more of these in the future. Um, but yeah, this is the English back sword by Cold Steel. My favorite sword. Um, you know, I, I'm, I hate that it's out of commission, but I want to improve it for my own use. So there you go. Uh, this sword has been featured on the channel before. This is a World War II Japanese. Uh, I guess it's called a Type 98 Shungunto or Shungunto, Mr. Rizzo. I believe you're the expert here. Uh, pardon the um, fingerprints and stuff. I've been making a handle for it. And, uh, you know, I'm not super, super careful as I will polish it all at the end. Um, we've knocked quite a bit of uh, scale and shit off of it. There is one original stain, if you can see. This stain right here. Um... And anybody who, you know, is a hunter or anything can recognize that that is some sort of, uh, you know, blood or something. And also you can tell by the pattern. Uh, you know, if you've ever, even if you cut a steak in your own house, if you cut it and lay it on the counter for a day, you will get that pattern. Uh, this, I was told that this sword was removed uh, from an adversary that my grandfather killed. 
Uh, there are some chips in the blade that do appear to match the antiquity of the rest of the sword. Um, so I believe that this, my grandfather wasn't, uh, you know, was never accused of lying. But uh, we're making a new handle. We're going, we're going to go Japanese traditional as far as, you know, only Westerners say, oh, you know, new polish is worse than old patina. Well, that's not how the Chinese people see it, and that's not how the Japanese people see it. That's why Japanese and Chinese swords that are thousands of years old are highly polished and perfectly sharp, and they're maintained throughout their life because they give respect in that way. Only Westerners, and maybe only Americans, uh, shout out to Matt Easton, you might have to weigh in on this, you know, idea. But, um, you know, only like American Civil War sword collectors will tell you, oh my God, don't touch it, don't touch it. But, you know, any Japanese historian will say, oh my gosh, this sword needs to be polished and brought back to the life in which it was intended for. And uh, I, I think that that's a beautiful sentiment. So, very lovely, very lovely sword. Uh, now I'm going to get into one uh, another cold steel product. This is the sword that y'all see me doing I believe all my cuts with I don't know if I've made any videos for y'all that's been a different sword this is the I cannot remember what year they call it but this is the Napoleonic Sabre the first version uh, it's highly customized it had a third it had a third bar that was making the sword very way too rotational so I removed that there was also studs in the handle. I removed that. I did quite a bit of shaping. Um, and I've reprofiled the blade quite a bit. I'm trying to get a single uh, single bevel from the fuller. So there's a lot of meat to take off. But this is the sword you see. Uh, it, it, you know, it has distal taper. Not an extreme amount, but it has distal taper. It does bend in the second half of the blade. Bends a little bit in the first half but mostly in the second. Uh, this is a good sword. It, the only thing I don't like about this sword, actually, is it is extremely overweight, and it is uh, front-heavy and all that kind of shit, but it makes a wonderful training weapon, right? It makes a good training weapon, because if you can pick this up and do some shit, any real antique sword is going to be spot-on for you, because this is overweight and hard to swing, and um, so it's a good training tool. I do like it. I do like it. This is the Cold Steel Napoleonic Sabre. I cannot remember the, the year that they attached to it. There is another, they have a second version that has a slightly different name. I can't remember what it's called. I've not seen that one. This is the original, <clears throat> the original version. Uh, I'm gonna move back to an antique. Shout out to Matthew Easton. I think that you would be a at Scholar Gladiatoria. I think you would be very interested to see this. This is a Burmese Dao, uh, purchased, might have been purchased on the Thai border side, um, but a beautiful, beautiful Dao with lots of engraving. My father, my father did, I don't know, three or four tours in Vietnam. And this is one of the only things that he ever brought back that still exists, as far as I know. Lots of decoration, lovely engraving. Lots of bands, lots of silver bands. There is silver in, I've been polishing this up slightly because I believe that's what we should do. There is silver inlay scroll work on both sides of the blade. Very nice. This is the original rope that came on it. And it has, it used to have about four of these decorative balls. Um, they were this color and like a pink. I'm sure they were probably red originally. Um, wooden scabbard, two piece, banded together. I love this sword. This is, this is my father's sword. You know, that's what I consider it as. This is my father's sword. And, and <clears throat> any Dow, uh, you know, is a beautiful, 
it's a beautiful tool to handle. It really is. I've never really picked any any version of a of a um, cow like this up and and not liked it. This has a fairly unique characteristic uh, belly on the tip and goes to a fairly acute point, um, which I think is definitely a much more traditional. Ones you see now that are made, you know, they're kind of stump tail. They, they kind of would stop in more like this, you know. But this one definitely has been, um, you know, engineered for not only work, but, uh, you know, machete style work, but also defense. Because that is a fairly pointy, 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 pointy end. Is it not? Anyway, so my father's Burmese. The Dao, I believe, is how it's pronounced. Not to be confused with the Dao. So, very nice. I'm going to move on to two swords together on, uh, on this one. This is a cold steel uh, 1863 heavy cavalry saber. Of course, all of us know that that is a misnomenclature. There never really was a heavy cavalry saber. In 1849, I believe, they issued a very large saber like this. Uh, and then in the 18... And, Kay, correct me if I have these wrong. Samurai Bird, uh, Scholar Gladiatoria, and any, anyone else. But So, 1849... Calvary Saber was a very heavy, large saber. I believe in 1860, they they changed to a basically the same saber, but smaller. And then there was a point, I believe in 63, they, the U.S. Army decided to reissue these larger style sabers. And these were, you know, called the old wrist breaker and stuff. But it's, it's really not what Cold Steel says. This is a great sword. This sword is much heavier and much longer than this other cold steel, but this one is balanced beautifully, and this one rocks and rolls, and that's one of the reasons I practice with that one, and then keep this one for, you know, whatever guy might really need it for. But this is a beautiful sword. Now, this right here, and we will do a video on just these two swords, because they, they do command their own respect. This, is an original 1863 Ames Calvary Saber issued during the United States War to Suppress Northern Aggression. This is the real deal, ladies and gentlemen. 1863, it's not been taken care of. It has extreme patina, but though it is even, okay? The guard is a bit loose. The, uh-oh. <laughs> You can also see this is bent. And it appears at some point in its history, it was painted red. Uh, but it, it appears to have, it does have the wire wrap. Uh, it is obviously peened. But so I, I will do a, we will do a comparison of these two swords. Um, you know, just to see, because I, I believe Cold Steel may thought that they were trying to make one of these, but they didn't really know. So there's some differences, but we will go through on a video the differences between the Cold Steel 1863 reproduction saber and an original Ames Civil War issue 1863 cavalry saber. But very proud of those. Very proud of both of these. It's they're very nice to have. They're very nice to have. Um, because we are collectors, are we not? All right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to show you these last two. Shout out to Lobot. Shout out to Paul. Shout out to all my friends out there and World War II companions and blacked out Ewoks. I think you might enjoy this too. These were my grandfathers. I'm going to show you both at once and then we'll go one at a time. I'm going to give you all a second to just see if you can identify what these are still in the sheath. Who just fucking shit their pants? Who just shit their fucking pants in the fucking watching this? I know you did. It's okay. It's okay. Let's start with this one. As uh, this may be mostly impressive to American collectors uh, and, and, and World War II collectors, but this is an American-made knife uh, that is a very famous 
It has a custom H hyzer out of Colorado sheath. The stone has long been gone. There might be a part of it is still in there, but this is, and I can't remember the exact model, but this is, you can see by the mark right there. This is an original World War II Randall fighting knife. And <laughs> this is one of the finest fighting knives ever made. You can always tell when they are for World War II as the sheath is always left-handed, if you notice, especially pilots. Their sheath is always left-handed as they usually got their fucking gun on the other side, right? But look at this. Look at this beauty here, would you? Stacked leather handle. Extremely sharp false edge. Very robust knife, if you can see the thickness. Let's see if we can't try to make that. If you can see the reinforced, uh, even the tip, see? Beautiful fighting knife. This belonged to my grandfather. If you want to look up Lieutenant Colonel R.A. Campbell. He was a fighter ace, flew a P-38 Lightning, and this is what he carried every fucking day. Love you, grandfather. Sure miss you, old man. Beautiful, beautiful knife. Now, this is also was my grandfather's. We'll have to get maybe Matt Easton, uh, you know, or Lobot or Paul or somebody to give this a good looking over. I believe this is a Mark I. metal sheath look at the look at how that sheath is cut out perfectly for this blade this is the famous probably the most famous fighting knife in modern history would have to be this is of course the Fairburn Sykes commando dagger original this has the solid brass handle um this is a killer, man. This is a killer. This is a killer, man. Remember, my grandfather always said, you never stab them with the knife. You grab them and you pull them onto the knife. <laughs> it's a dangerous weapon. This can be a dangerous weapon in the hands of anybody, but especially can be dangerous in the hands of someone who knows how to use it. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, this is one of my pride and joys. This was my grandfather's. This, um, you know, monetarily has quite a bit of value. Uh, these last two knives probably, I'd, I have a lot of different collectibles and a lot of different um, types of collections, but these two are definitely in the top of uh, monetary value, you know. Um, but <clears throat> they're so sentimental that, you know, the monetary value means almost nothing because it's, you know, it's something I want my kids to have and I want their kids to have it too. So, but yeah, isn't that something? Look at this sheath, reinforced metal tip, quick, quick release, frog style. See, it has, see, it, it has a frog, see? How cool is that? Anyway. I hope everybody enjoyed this. We're going to do some more collection showing. Uh, you know, if y'all want to see, this is just my Power of the Force carded. Uh, there is a carded Paplu. There's a Black Series. Here's one of those cool, funky, all the different color prototype things. Here's a uh, uh, vintage collection. Shout out to Blue. Blue Sasquatch. He sent me that. But anyway, yeah. I just wanted to show you guys this. You know, uh, and we'll be showing lots of different collectibles. You know, lack is not, I'm not limited to just action figures, you know. And uh, my action figure collection mostly consists of what I still have as from a child. And, you know, a lot of my new purchasing collection, I'd have to say, is at least 60% because I want to make a custom out of it. And others are, you know, obviously the, you know, what did I say, 60? So, like, the other 40% is literally like like you know oh fuck man i loved swamp thing as a kid i want that oh man the phantom is the fucking bomb i i gotta get that 
So that's kind of my, uh, as far as that. Um, we have a lot of collectibles on the mothership. Um, you know, we collect antique furniture, we collect antique firearms, we collect edge weapons, we collect life stories and knowledge, most of all, and we hope to be able to pass that on to anybody who wants to learn. Well, I appreciate everybody. This has been Lack Sivrak, and I will continue to be. Uh, I hope you all found this interesting. Uh, we, uh, we, will do we will do a look at the comparison of these two sabers, like I said. If there's any other uh, edged weapons here, you'd like to maybe get a little closer look or a bit more uh, closer study, maybe its own video, just drop it in the comments. I appreciate everybody, uh, especially the people, you know, who are friends because we're friends. You know, there's a lot of people out there that, um, well, shout out to Gilster. Gilster knows. Gilster knows. We can't all fucking talk about one subject forever. Can we? Can you? Love you, Gilly. I hope you're doing well, my friend. I hope your interview went well. I hope that, hey, there'll be another one. It's all gravy, baby. So anyway, this has been Lex Sivrak. I appreciate everybody. And uh, I hope y'all enjoyed that, all right? Because I enjoy sharing with y'all, all right? So we'll see everybody down the trail.